So as uh, the last lecture of this course on co communication electronics, I decided to describe a little bit frequency synthesizers. We already talked in the last lecture about electronic oscillators. Uh, no matter how good an electronic oscillator we can build, it can usually not fulfill all the requirements of our for our communication either radio or uh, wired, so optical. And uh, in, in, this, uh, in this frame, uh, we need some more complex circuits that do not include just an oscillator. Uh, an oscillator can provide low phase noise, uh, can provide uh, can provide low phase noise, but at the same time, if uh, we build uh, an oscillator that's built particularly for low phase noise, it usually cannot provide uh, frequency tuning. So many different frequencies, it, it can only provide one single frequency, as, and frequency, and we looked at this problem already in the lecture about local oscillators. So where uh, first we have to look where does the frequency requirement uh, come from in uh, communication equipment. If we look at uh, re radio receiver tuning back one, more than 100 years back at the beginning of radio, the uh, loaded queue of uh, electric tuned circuits with a coil and a capacitor uh, was high enough to perform enough selectivity in our receiver. For very primitive communications uh, like hand typed uh, telegraphy and hand uh, ear received telegraphy, so just with human communication, human operators, and no particularly sophisticated electronics. Somewhat, uh, somewhat better selectivity was already provided by the Q multiplier circuits invented almost at the same time by Meissner and Armstrong. And here, with pro pro by providing a, a, a very well chosen degree of positive feedback from the output of an amplifier back to the input, the quality factor of the tuned circuits could be multiplied uh, perhaps by a factor of 10, say, coming up to around 1000. Uh, going further on, most radio receivers uh, developed into heterodyne receivers, uh, so using a local oscillator to define the actual operating frequency on the antenna. So uh, the bandpass filter was tuned to a fixed frequency, the intermediate frequency bandpass filter, here is IF, intermediate frequency, uh, was tuned to a fixed frequency while uh, we tuned the receiver to many different frequencies by adjusting the local oscillator. So all the difficult requirements now shifted from the filter itself, like here or here. So here the filter itself provided, uh, had to provide some tuning for different frequency tuning, shifted uh, into the oscillator circuit. Even here, such a variable frequency oscillator could not be made uh, particularly stable for even more demanding modulation schemes here, uh, here in the intermediate frequency. Uh, not just amplitude modulation, but more uh, complicated modulation schemes like uh, with coherent detectors that require very precise carrier tuning. Uh, so. Uh, how could this uh, frequency of a tuned circuit could be adjusted? The tuned circuit that actually uh, governs here the frequency of the local oscillator. It will be usually the local oscillator, not a direct receiver with a direct filter inside, uh, inside the signal path. So one of the first solution was building a, a variable capacitor using a variable capacitor with uh, rotating plates so the area of these capacitors could be changed or even the spacing of the plates could be changed to change the frequency of this circuit to tune the uh, circuit to exactly the frequency we wanted. A similar function may also be performed by 
uh, varactor diodes or varicap diodes. Usually two varactors are used in anti-series connection so that a larger RF voltage can be applied to these varactors without incurring into distortion because varactors are non-linear capacitors so they do cause distortion. Here the tuning is simply performed by adjusting the DC voltage, the, DC, the reverse bias on both varactors simultaneously through a potentiometer, through a, a DC power supply and uh, the radio frequency choke, usually a resistor is used in place, this R varactor is usually used in place of uh, uh, coils here as a radio frequency choke because uh, this re resistor does not introduce any additional uh, resonances of this tuned circuit. So no, uh, no, uh, no complicated uh, uh, response functions are obtained because of a resistor. Resistor is just dumping the signal. Here the current is very low, it's less than one microampere. So the resistor can, may have very high values and uh, does not affect actually the radio frequency performance of this tuned circuit. Uh, what could be done in place of capacitor adjustment? Here you have capacitor adjustment, and here you have capacitor adjustment. Though this was a mechanically adjustable capacitor or an electronically adjustable, uh, adjustable capacitor, we could also adjust the inductivity of the coil in the tuned circuit. One very old uh, solution to adjust the inductivity of the coil is to actually build two coils and adjust the magnetic coupling between these two coils. If one coil is rotated in, uh, with respect to the other coil, we can have both, uh, 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 we can find both an inductivity increase or an inductivity decrease uh, uh, regarding the mutual, mutual coupling, the mutual inductivity between the two coils. So this can be both plus and minus just rotating one coil or B0 where this rotation angle is equal to 90 degrees. Uh, this adjust adjustable magnetic coupling is frequently called a variometer, but the word variometer now is mis misused in many, uh, many other uh, fields of science. So I would prefer not to use it. I would say this adjustable, I would just call this adjustable magnetic coupling. Uh, once we had uh, available ferromagnetic materials for the high frequencies involved, this is not just iron, this has to be ferrite materials or at least uh, iron powder glued together so that it does not, does not have uh, uh, much losses at high frequencies, we can adjust uh, the frequency of a tuned circuit by shifting this ferromagnetic core. This is also called PTO, permit, permeability tuned oscillator if it's built inside an oscillator. Uh, this is a very practical solution as long as we have ferrite cores, but ferrite cores are frequency limited, say, to around 100 MHz. Ferrites can be built for frequencies higher than 100 MHz, but they tend to be very expensive and uh, the adjustment rate is not, not so as large as for, for ferrite materials for low frequencies. This is also a possibility to adjust the inductivity here, to adjust the frequency of the tuned circuit. Uh, we can also shift the frequency of quartz crystals. Uh, we can load quartz crystals either with capacitors or with inductors. We obtain more uh, frequency shift using inductors because of the uh, equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal that has a parallel capacitance of its electrodes. So that parallel capacitance uh, makes uh, inductive tuning more efficient. This uh, tuning is uh, very, very narrow band. This is mainly used uh, to adjust for the tolerances of the manufacturing tolerances of the crystal. Uh, even uh, this tuning is way too narrow band, way too narrow, way way too to narrow 0.1 percent, even for narrow band frequency modulation. We cannot obtain narrow band frequency modulation uh, by adjusting the uh, resonant frequency of a quartz crystal with external circuits. This is usually not enough. It's just enough to compensate for the tolerances of the crystal itself. 
so such an adjustment can be used uh, and it was used in broadcast receivers in TV uh, reception sets uh, so in uh, with analog communications this uh, all these solutions here were used in many different occasions but uh, today our circuits we are using today our receivers and transmitters we are using today are far more demanding uh, regarding frequency stability uh, also uh, much more demand demanding about phase noise phase noise for short-term variations frequency stability for long-term variations but the physical effect in back the background is the same so all these circuits do no longer provide uh, the uh, perform uh, the performances that are good enough for today requirements so what can we do better than uh, LC tuned circuits uh, this was first done in the world in the Second World War in uh, receive uh, in uh, radios transceivers frequency modulated transceivers used on tanks uh, a tank is a very noisy environment, uh, frequency modulation, modulation doesn't help here much, but uh, what uh, really helps in the tank is that these things ha have to be reliable and ha have to work quickly. So simply the radios used on board tanks were designed to operate on 80 different frequencies. And the operator simply had a box of 80 different crystals for his transmitter and each crystal was just a lap to was just polished to the exact frequency requirement required in 100 kilohertz steps to cover the whole frequency range for 20 from 20 to 28 megahertz this was the frequency range used by tank receivers uh, the receiver could use could still use in this tank receivers the first receivers could still use an lc tuned circuit with a variable a capacitor but later on they were also replaced by crystals so uh, this was a simple tra the transmitter was simple a chain of multipliers followed by a power amplifier at the final frequency chain of multipliers to allow phase modulation because the crystals could not be modulated enough so phase modulation had to be used and phase modulation uh, due to the limited phase angle needs quite a large here uh, multiplication index this multiplication index may go up here on this picture may go up to some 60 around 60 so uh, quite large um, um, multiplication index here uh, in the receiving part in the receiver part it was a simple heterodyne receiver and only the local oscillator need to be tuned to a particular frequency it could be done me mechanically with LC oscillators but the better solution was using crystals these crystals were all these crystals you you here the operator actually needed uh, exactly the same amount of crystals as was the number of frequencies here manufacturing such a large amount of crystals uh, was expensive uh, for military purposes this is not a problem for but for many civilian purposes uh, this is quite an expensive box of 80 crystals here and 80 crystals here so alternative solutions were sought though this solution having for each channel a single crystal was used for many many years even after the second world war maybe up to the 1900 80 uh, if, uh, maybe for 40 years after the second world war if you just needed a few channels a few crystals could be could solve this problem without making this uh, this chain too complicated and also a few crystals in the receiving part so that also the receiving frequency was very stable this was the practical uh, solution uh, then uh, when such radios were built after the second world war uh, this uh, this kind of radios in the second world war were, were only used by the united states of america because they all, only they had uh, availability they have had crystal the raw material the quartz crystal available and they had the manufacturing expertise to manufacture large amounts of crystals other nations involved in the second world war simply used uh, lc tuning in all of their military radios 
So this was really something new coming from the United States during the Second World War. After the war, crystal controlled radios, quartz crystals controlled radios, became quite popular and there were requirements from the, from the market to build uh, as cheap radios as possible and making the radios cheap means uh, me making inexpensive radios means reducing the number of crystals used. So citizen band radio transceivers, transceivers that could be used without a radio license, were intended to be very cheap. And uh, initially they were required to operate on 24 channels both on reception and on transmission. Simplex channels so is same frequency on transmission and reception, but because of the heterodyne design of the receiver, the local oscillator of the receiver had to operate at slightly different frequencies than the op um, local oscillator of the transmitter. So, the key here was to use two groups of crystals. A group of six crystals against a group of four crystals. So summing the frequencies of these four crystals with the group uh, with uh, the frequency of these crystals, there are 24 possible combinations, considering four possible selections here and six possible selections here. So 24 channels in the transmit side could be obtained just with uh, uh, here 10 different crystals. Uh, four crystals for the 10 kilohertz step, steps and six crystals for the 50 kilohertz steps. There were also, there were not 40 kilohertz steps because one step was always left aside, so one step was not used. Four steps were used and was intentionally inserted a blank channel and there were again four steps and intentionally again a blank channel. This was the principle of design of a citizen band radio transceiver. Uh, in the receiving chain, uh, these crystals could be uh, used also as the first local oscillator for the first mixing inside the receiver. Only the second mixing required slightly different frequencies, so it required uh, addition, an additional here four crystals to obtain the 24 receiving channels on the same frequency of, as the 24 transmitting channels. So with a total of 14 crystals, uh, one could obtain 24 transmitting channels and on the same frequencies 24 receiving channels. This was the maximum possible economy designing a citizen band radio. Other radios were also designed according to the same principle, radios that had to cover several frequencies on exact channels, like uh, Aircraft radios. Aircraft radios use the frequency band from 118 up to 136 megahertz. So this is 18 megahertz. Uh, initially with 50 kilohertz channels. So 50 kilohertz channels uh, and 18 megahertz. That's 360 different channels. So they use 18 crystals here to obtain the 1 megahertz step for the 18 megahertz coverage and 20 crystals here to obtain 50 kilohertz steps to cover each megahertz with 50 kilohertz channels. Uh, then this was further modified to 25 kilohertz channels uh, to have uh, 720 channels in total in an aircraft radio. But aircraft radios also operate with amplitude modulation, so an AM detector. All the principle of operation of an AM transceiver for uh, aviation is exactly the same as the principal operation of an analog citizen band radio transceiver, only that uh, numbers are a little bit different, but uh, the idea is again to have two groups of crystals uh, to obtain many, many more channels. So uh, an uh, aviation radio could obtain 360 channels with just 10 uh, 20 crystals here and 18 crystals here, so in total 38 crystals provided 360 channels. That was quite a good economy uh, for an aviation uh, av airborne uh, transceiver. Uh, coming to digital technologies, many digital solutions were proposed to generate many different frequencies. One very simple and very straightforward digital solution is to have an adder here, a 32-bit adder and a 32-bit accumulator. This 32-bit accumulator is a D-latch 
and this is the, the latch is clocked by a very stable clock frequency a clock frequency obtained by uh, from a crystal oscillator and multiplied to perhaps a few gigahertz here of clock frequency so what this uh, numerically controlled oscillator nco it means numerical control oscillator can do it generates many frequencies here in digital format in 32 bit digital format uh, since this is just summation, actually we get a so tooth kind of waveform here uh, in, in its analog representation. Uh, so, a so tooth waveform here uh, with many different possible frequencies. This uh, constant that is added all of the time directly determines the frequency uh, of the output. So, the frequency is just the clock frequency here multiplied by n by this constant and divided by 2 to the 30 um, 32nd power here uh, this is the m uh, possible representations here in this accumulator 32 bit accumulator now having everything done digitally uh, this digital result has to be converted into analog form so first a so tooth is not not a pr of a particular use in radio communication we need a sine wave so we have a sine uh, sine lookup table inside a read only memory chip to convert a digital so tooth into a digital sine wave and then this digital sine wave have has to be converted by a digital to analog converter into an analog form at the output Finally, this digital to analog conversion is working at a fixed uh, at a fixed clock rate. So it does ge not generate just one frequency at its output. It generates many frequencies and their mirror images. So to select just one useful image, we need a low pass or maybe a band pass filter here. A simple low pass filter simply has the bandwidth. Uh, lower than half of the clock frequency here in this way we can generate any frequency very simply by choosing this content here so uh, the response time of this frequency synthesizer is very very short as we change the constant here the frequency changes immediately so everything looks fine up to this point we can obtain many channels with a 32-bit uh, accumulator we obtain 2 to the 32nd uh, power of channels uh, we can have uh, accumulators even with more bits with uh, say 40 or 48 bits so the number of different frequencies generated by this circuit is really high this is not a limit we really obtain many channels we have very fast modulation here this modulation is fast enough uh, uh, say to perform frequency hopping with these different frequencies or even to perform digital frequency modulation this is fast enough so this is all very fine uh, performance of this circuit the problem of this circuit is a quite large power consumption so here uh, this clock frequency should be twice as large as the maximum frequency we need at the output so this clock frequency is the in the gigahertz range uh, a D-latch, uh, several bits wide, here is 32 bit wide, and, the Q, uh, and a summer, also 32 bit summer, can operate at 1 GHz, but at a relatively high power drain. And so we need about 1 Watt per GHz of clock frequency, and that's a huge uh, uh, power requirement. On the other side, we obtain an excellent phase noise here even at slow uh, low spacings because uh, everything is driven from a crystal oscillator and here the loaded Q of the crystal oscillator can be done uh, very uh, excellent so we get an excellent phase noise here where is the main problem of this circuit the main problem is non harmonic spurious signals that appear on its output the number of bits of this D2A converter is limited if we have here a 12 bit D2A converter a uh, 12-bit D2A converter will provide a signal to interference ratio of n is 12 times 6 bits this is 72 dB so this non-harmonic spurious signals will be just 72 dB below the desired output in 
in uh, radio communication this is usually not acceptable we could filter the far away spores but some of these non-harmonic spores may come at some particularly frequency set particular frequency settings may come uh, extremely close to the desired signal so these are always present and some of them come very close to the desired f out and this is a problem that cannot be solved though 72 db is not such a bad figure some radio receivers still use this principle some test equipment like even spectrum analyzers even complicated spectrum analyzers still use this uh, this uh, principle of operation but um, it is not very popular uh, for the high power drain and uh, non-harmonic spores that cannot be eliminated easily that those two problems are not easy to do not have any easy solution so the idea is now to go to a different design of a digital frequency synthesizer still using digital logic to simplify our life uh, so first uh, the component we need for this digital synthesis we are going to generate the signal with a voltage controlled oscillator a voltage controlled oscillator we actually mentioned already in our discussion here say uh, the varactors are being used uh, in uh, tuned circuits and this tuned circuit is actually controlling an electronic oscillator so this is a voltage controlled oscillator uh, here one possibility is a Colpitz oscillator, it not, needs not be Colpitz really. It is tuned uh, with the reverse bias on both varactor diodes and it provides an output frequency. Of course, the Q of uh, uh, tuned circuits using varactors cannot be particularly high. In the useful frequency range around 1 gigahertz, the Q may, be, may range only between Q loaded, only maybe between 10 and 30. So the phase noise of this oscillator is not very good. Also, the frequency stability is not very good because both varactors and coil uh, depend on the temperature and also the parasitics of the transistor the gain of the transistor depends on the temperature so uh, such a voltage controlled oscillator may be very helpful for us if we could con could make a fast uh, uh, a frequency control loop that's fast enough both to remove close in phase noise and to remove uh, remove closed phase noise and to keep this oscillator stably on the desired frequency uh, nevertheless this is one of the components we are going to need for our uh, frequency synthesizer so we are trying to do the best we can here uh, actually the frequency coverage of such an oscillator is given by the capacitance ratio of the varactor diodes and this, this uh, maximum frequency versus minimum frequency is uh, identical to the square root of the ratio of the capacitance because the uh, resonant frequency of a tuned circuit has the capacitance under a square root here this square root gives us the square root dependence so a typical value we can talk here maybe uh, maximum versus minimum capacitance of varactors is 1 to 10 minimum to maximum uh, so the maximum frequencies uh, versus minimum frequencies is 3 to 1 here approximately 3 to 1 slightly more than 3 to 1 this is this is what could be done with such a um, VCO uh, with an LC tuned circ circuit that are other kinds of VCOs that cover a wider frequency band but they do not have an LC tuned circuit they have just RC circuits uh, the loaded Q is around close to unity and the phase noise of those oscillators is much worse uh, we describe our oscillator with a constant the sensitivity of our oscillator so if we ch change the tuning voltage here uh, uh, the tuning voltage the varactor voltage uh, we change the frequency so how much does the frequency change with respect to the tuning voltage so this is kvco the constant of our varactor this is in fact the slope of the varactor if we plot the frequency of the varactor versus the tuning voltage uh, if we make here a change in the tuning voltage we obtain the change in the frequency 
uh, this is a constant of our VCO and we we will need this constant in our calculations of the circuits we are going to design uh, what we have to keep in mind is that KVCO can be described both with the angular frequency omega or with the more conventional frequency F so we have frequency in Hertz here or frequency in radians per second we obtain two different KVCO and we have to keep carefully use the correct values in our circuit design so this is the first uh, block we are going to use in our frequency synthesis uh, the next block we have to build a control loop for such a voltage controlled oscillator to reduce the fa close in phase noise and to improve the long term frequency stability and such a control loop is usually a phase locked loop so uh, we lock the frequency of our VCO to a known crystal oscillator but the frequency of the crystal oscillator is not the same as the frequency of the VCO uh, the uh, frequency of the crystal oscillator is uh, the VCO is related to the uh, crystal frequency by this ratio of this uh, modulus of these two dividers this is an integer divider a digital divider this is a digital circuit and this is a digital circuit by choosing R and N we may obtain many locking of the VCO and many different frequencies and then next our loop our control loop here will uh, control the frequency of the oscillator to keep the VCO exactly at this ratio we selected with our dividers usually we select the frequency just changing the N R is changed less frequently though it has a similar effect on the output frequency now the question is what to compare here shall we compare the frequency or shall we compare the phase or shall we compare both of them what is the correct solution here and in fact we do have frequency control frequency locked loops we do have phase locked loops for a completely automatic circuit we actually need both and uh, in uh, the following discussion we are going to see how to perform both frequency and phase uh, control in the same circuit for uh, locked phase loop for a phase um, for a loop that already achieved lock they already acquired lock uh, in the locked state we only need a multiplier here. we multiply both signals say if they are cosine shape and uh, the output of this multiplier has a term cosine phi that is directly proportional to the phase shift between this signal and this signal so locking our VCO on the phase shift here we keep its phase stably locked to the reference and if frequencies were locked also the frequency will stay locked here uh, of course building any practical world circuit also has consequences and one of the consequences here is that a multiplier also provides outputs at different frequencies say the second harmonic here this is the second harmonic with this term here this cosine here and this second harmonic uh, may cause uh, may cause unwanted frequency modulation of the VCO may cause spurious outputs may degrade the phase nose so after the our multiplier which is used as a phase detector to detect the phase here we actually we, uh, we really need a low pass filter to remove all this interference caused by unwanted terms of multiplication here so the design of such a phase locked loop will not be that simple further uh, we have to achieve frequency locked first before we can even talk about phase locked lock because we, if we don't have phase lock also this term here will have uh, will include a difference of the two frequencies we are not identical and this difference is, difference may be way too large to get it to make it through the low pass filter so uh, loop, such a loop with just uh, phase uh, comparison here may not may never acquire lock that's a problem 
so we have to find the circuit that performs both uh, uh, frequency and phase comparison here uh, the final result is that this thing looks very attractive we are using inexpensive electronics uh, digital dividers are cheap multiplier we know how to make one we need a low pass filter for a fixed frequency low pass frequency. this is also we need a VCO like described on the in the previous discussion here uh, we need needed a VCO uh, we need needed a crystal oscillator we also discussed how to design this thing and um, close to the desired output frequency uh, inside the loop bandwidth of this phase locked loop uh, the phase noise will will be directly related to the crystal oscillator so it will be very very good uh, besides these expensive electronics all these circuits can be made for low power drain so that's important for portable equipment all of these circuits many of these circuits can be integrated on a single chip so all electronics here is included on a single chip except for the quartz crystal here everything else can be included on a single chip and we have a very large choice of R and N dividers so that's the reason why such a circuit looks attractive the issue is now how to make the comparison of both frequency and phase in the same circuit and the solution for a such frequency and phase comparator is called a charge pump circuit a charge pump circuit includes two D flip flops both D flip flops are initially at zero and they jump to the one state when uh, receiving a clock pulse at its, in at its input. So one of the flip flops is working with the reference frequency coming from the crystal oscillator and the other flip flop is receiving uh, the, its clock frequency divided from the VCO. Now, if we receive just uh, clock pulses from the references, many clock pulses for, for reference, only this flip-flop will get triggered. If this gets triggered, it will turn on this switched current source and it will charge the capacitor supplying the varicap voltage. So this voltage will increase, hopefully increasing the frequency of our VCO. If I increase the tuning voltage, I will increase the frequency. On the other hand, if the frequency of the VCO is too large, only this flip-flop gets triggered and this flip-flop turns a discharging current source that will discharge this capacitor to reduce the frequency, to decrease the frequency of the VCO. So we do have control already with this circuit, we do have frequency control. If both flip-flops get triggered, uh, then uh, if both are at one we, if an, the up and down signals are both at one then through an uh, end gate we reset both flip-flops so both flip-flops are not allowed to be in the state of one if they happen to be in the state of one they are both reset to zero this reset action takes, us, takes a certain amount of time depending on the speed of the logic this is a few nanoseconds uh, be careful when designing such a circuits because uh, this circuit uh, actually uh, most uh, FPGA software FG, FPGA programming software does not allow a feedback uh, from a flip-flop output to an asynchronous input like the reset input so this is usually not allowed by many FPGA uh, programming software but we actually need it here and we have to be very careful what amount of delay do we build in the, into this AND gate we actually need some delay to reliably reset both circuits but uh, this, uh, uh, this delay also has problems as we shall see later on the other hand if we get here either up pulses or down pulses we can detect them and we can trigger the LED here, the light emitting diode unlocked. So our circuit will tell us if pulses are present here, white pulses, or if white pulses are present here. 
an LED, an, a red LED will lock, so the circuit is not working. So to warn the user that the circuit is not operational for whatever reason. All these things here can be integrated. This is very simple integrated a simple single single integrated circuit. So this is very simple simple to be done. So uh, once we achieved lock, so here I showed both situations. When we have many reference pulses, we get wide pulses to charge the capacitor, and the voltage is uh, raising on the capacitor. Where we have, when we have many pulses, many more pulses coming from the divided VCO frequency, uh, the capacitor is now discharging, the frequency of the VCO is being decreased. In the locked state, we have the exact number of pulses, both from the reference and from the VCO. And uh, at the output, we get these pulses. These pulses uh, that are very narrow. De depending on our logic, this is a few nanoseconds. And we get a stable voltage on the capacitor, on our capacitor, we get a stable voltage. So now the, VC, uh, the VCO is precisely locked to our reference with no, distur any, uh, no, no disturbs present here. Uh, the width of these pulses, of course, makes some problems. It's not the same how fast uh, a logic do we have here. How fast is this logic? Uh, this is somewhat uh, 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 limited here uh, because uh, this actually causes a backlash problem. A backlash problem, so uh, the phase can still, uh, if we look here at the circuit, uh, these pulses can still wander around their stable phase here and they can produce, they do not produce any correction pulses uh, at the output. So this backlash problem we have, we try to keep it the smallest possible backlash problem. We get with uh, finite width pulses defined by the delay here in this gate. In this gate. So to design the feedback circuit, we also need the constant of this whole circuit. And this is called the k phi, the constant of our phase detector. And uh, so uh, now it depends whether we specify the angle phi in radians. So maybe amps of currents per radian of phase different here. Uh, this is for uh, angular frequencies. We have angles specified in radians, or for conventional frequencies, we have uh, uh, specified k phi specified in amps per cycle. Per cycle, this is per cycle, this is per radian, depending whether we have angular frequencies or conventional frequencies in our formulas. So with this uh, expression here, we actually uh, define what is the response of uh, our frequency phase comparator, when this, where this, uh, this uh, k phi is finally defined just for the phase only. Frequency, we achieve frequency lock initially quite quickly. We achieve frequency lock, so we move from these two, these two cases in back into this case. And here when we have uh, phase lock, here we, we were achieving, we were trying to achieve frequency lock, then we achieve phase lock. In the phase lock, this backlash of 3 nanoseconds is the final limiting parameter of such a circuit. So this uh, frequency phase comparator, the charge pump, uh, switches uh, autonomously from frequency comparison. St it starts with frequency comparison and autonomously ch ch switches from frequency to phase. So this is a very, really very important advantage of this circuit. There were other, uh, back in the past, there were other circuits used. There were uh, PLLs built with just multipliers as phase detectors, and they had separate logic to achieve frequency, uh, frequency lock first. But uh, the charge pump circuit is uh, this beautiful circuit that solves both problems with a single circuit and really a very efficient circuit. So that's the reason why the charge pump is used nowadays. And now we have here at the, the output, we store the voltage actually to drive the reactors in a capacitor. Uh, if uh, the circuits drift out of uh, lock, 
soon uh, these pulses will shift against these pulses and there will be a net uh, these pulses will no longer subtract the output pulse will no longer subtract but at the output we will achieve we will achieve some width of a pulse in the up direction or in the right in the down direction to correct for the phase error uh, so this is the operation of our charge pump. So we have our main components here. We have the VCO, we have the charge pump, and now we try to assemble the whole circuit of our phase locked loop uh, using these components described where they're uh, they're uh, discovered with their components. So we have a charge pump circuit. Uh, charging or discharging capacitor, driving a VCO, we have a frequency divider and now out of this division we have to integrate this frequency over time to get the phase angle and see that we are here we have a phase locked loop uh, where we compare this uh, actual phase of the VCO divided by the module N with the reference phase here and the difference of the two is actually driving the charge pump circuit. Charge pump circuit is divided by K phi, this is for the uh, phase detector and the VCO is divided, uh, de described by K VCO. Apparently this circuit should work with the charge pump as we describe it here with the spices. Uh, tuning first the voltage to obtain first frequency lock and then trying to obtain phase lock. But frequency lock is obtained first. Unfortunately, there's a problem. This loop is a feedback loop. This feedback loop now contains two integrators. One integrator is this capacitor here. That includes uh, this integrator uh, now uh, inserts a 90 degree phase shift between the input signal that corresponds to the current is corresponding to the phase to the output signal to the voltage and we have yet another integrator when we, we are trying to observe the phase angle from the frequency and that's yet another integration here so two phase shifts by 90 degrees make a total phase shift of 180 degrees such a loop such a feedback loop could achieve lock but it is not stable in the locking point if we are trying to plot the its uh, response h of omega in the nyquist plot its response comes from minus infinity here all the way to zero it is blue line and this response actually intersects the point minus one this intersection is actually an unstable point because at this intersection when h of omega is equal to minus one we have one minus one here we have an infinite phase error we got them because we have division by zero here so we will see where the instability comes from we are just hitting the minus one point here uh, we could also calculate at what frequency is this going to happen. This is uh, the control signal, not the actual radio frequencies we have here, omega VCO, omega VCO divided. This is just the uh, harmonic interference of very low frequency. Of very low frequency. Uh, we, I'm simplifying this discussion just using frequency, so I'm... Uh, simplifying the complex fre complex frequency s that's sigma plus j omega with just j omega we're just dealing with j omega just to simplify our question because we see here where the solution is and the solution is hitting minus one so this means an unstable phase locked loop so everything looked uh, very nice here we could design the vco up here we could design the charge pump but uh, the final result was a disaster. Also, the charge pump was a very good detector. It did not, it provided only very, in the locked state, it provided only very narrow pulse, so it was not difficult to filter them away just with a single capacitor. But the real problem is that this loop is unstable. We do not achieve a stable lock here. And this lock may be 
wandering around at this uh, interference frequency. This interference frequency it's a low frequency disturbance, low frequency modulation of the VCO, much lower than the omega VCO or omega VCO divided by n. So this is a very low frequency instability and this instability is in our control loop so the frequency of the VCO will not be stable but it will be uh, it will oscillate around around the desired value and this is not what we would like to do so in next hour we have to what we have to see it we could do everything everything was technically feasible the VCO was technically feasible the charge pump was technically feasible. Uh, later on, we are also going to d d uh, discuss a little bit the frequency dividers. But the real problem is an unstable loop we have here. This unstable loop actually is not useful. We have to find a feedback circuit here that will make this loop stable. This can be done. It's used frequently in many engineering problems. It's also quite uh, almost 100 years old. The solution to this problem was almost 100 years old, though they didn't know about phase lock loop at the loops at the time. But they had many other engineers had many other stability problems that have uh, the same issue here. Where you see when in this equation for h of omega, we have the case of both the phase comparator and the VCO, uh, we have uh, the frequency of the disturb, disturbing uh, unwanted uh, frequency modulation, we have the capacitor C and we have the N, the modulo of this divider. So we have everything in this formula. And unfortunately, we hit minus one, so we have an unstable loop. Next hour, we are see at we, we will see at engineering solutions, also proposed by Harry Nyquist, and also proposed by proposed by Felix Strecker already a few years before Heinrich Nyquist, how to solve this stability problem of this loop. But this problem has to be solved first.